This video is on cooperative strategy. So over the years, uh, there's been an increasing use of alliances um, from very rare in the uh, 70s to increasingly popular, and this trend continues today. Now, one important thing to uh, remember is that uh, strategic alliances are very different than collusive alliances, which are illegal. All right, so there are many different types of alliances. So Starbucks, as an example, uh, can work with channel partners such as uh, Weston Hotels or United Airlines uh, just to get their brand, uh, the brand on those uh, places. Uh, they can do geographic expansion partners into new areas. Uh, they can create new uh, products with partners such as a Starbucks branded uh, ice cream or uh, getting their Star uh, Starbucks coffee into PepsiCo bottles um, or retail format partners uh, like getting into a Barnes and Noble uh, coffee shop. So there are three types of uh, strategic alliances. There are non-equity strategic alliances. Uh, these are contractual relationships uh, where the two or more firms are sharing resources and capabilities, uh, but there is no separate entity created. There are uh, equity strategic alliances and joint ventures, which are very similar in that two or more firms are creating a legally independent company. Uh, the main difference between these two is that a joint venture has uh, equal percentages between each of the uh, parent firms. Uh, where an equity strategic alliance, uh, there is a different percentage, uh, generally because one of the partners has some uh, significant advantage. It could be that one of the partners is very small while one is very large, or one has uh, some other competitive advantage or technology that gives them leverage in creating a, a disproportionate uh, partnership. An example of non-equity strategic alliance would be a licensing agreement. Uh, with NFL and Nike, which I believe is out of date, and there's now someone else uh, running that, but uh, simply uh, giving the license to Nike to make the official NFL uniforms uh, that are in use. A joint venture uh, between ABC, NBC, and Fox came together to create uh, Hulu, where they each owned a third of uh, it and set out to uh, create their own streaming platform uh, to fight off people like Netflix. Equity Strategic Alliance is between Toyota and GM. They came together to create the New United Motor Manufacturing Inc. Uh, NUMMI in 1984. And then uh, later uh, in 2010, Toyota then uh, brought Tesla Motors uh, into this to uh, work on their battery technology together for their upcoming hybrid vehicles. Now, very different from uh, typical cooperative strategy alliances, there are collusive strategies. Now, these fall into two categories. One is explicit collusion. Um, these tend to be illegal, uh, are occasionally sanctioned by government policies, but in general uh, are illegal. Um, these have become increasingly rare as uh, globalization has sort of forced uh, the places where these occurred to sort of get stamped out. Um, the other kind is tacit collusion, uh, also called mutual forbearance. Uh, these are when firms sort of tacitly work together, uh, but they are not uh, getting together and deciding in a cigar smoke filled room to raise their prices uh, or otherwise screw the customer. Um, they are sort of taking hints from each other and responding to each other in ways that allow them to sort of reap a lot of the benefits of collusion where, uh, for instance, one airline comes up with a new fee and then quickly everyone else adds that fee uh, such that now the prices have gone up for customers. Uh, but there was no meeting, there's no sort of trail or evidence that you could uh, prosecute under, um, but the outcome is the same. So this is tacit collusion when, when companies are sort of uh, working together 
invisibly, uh, but uh, raising prices above sort of what normal competition uh, would create. Reasons for cooperative strategies. We have uh, slow cycle reasons, which could be uh, gain access to a restric restricted market, such as something that's uh, heavily regulated or uh, perhaps in another country that's difficult to get into uh, or requires some type of uh, equity of uh, native uh, citizen or native firm. Uh, it's a way to sort of easily franchise into a new market. Um, fast cycle is all about speed. So uh, alliances can help you speed up R&D, um, share the cost of R&D. So you see this uh, with the battery technologies where multiple uh, otherwise competitors uh, in the car industry are helping each other develop better technology for batteries because that is crucial to uh, moving towards these electric vehicles that a lot of governments are mandating. Um, so they're coming together to uh, do that uh, in these alliances and share that piece and then go back and compete on other things. Uh, it can also help you maintain market leadership, create uh, larger uh, relative, you know, market share in your alliance, um, and uh, sort of you can see, see this with uh, technology standards where multiple big companies will get behind a standard. Um, sometimes you'll have two competing standards, um, and to try to push their standard that the company has invested money in um, and is pushing. Uh, they'll try to create these alliances so that that becomes the de facto standard and their money isn't wasted. And when you have competing standards, uh, it can then take a while if they both have pretty equally uh, sized alliances. And then finally, a standard cycle, uh, gain market power, uh, similarly to the uh, fast cycle, uh, gain access to complementary resources. Uh, maybe an alliance allows you to sort of get uh, access to resources your firm doesn't have uh, that complement your own resources well or new products and services. Um, you can therefore also get better economies of scale, our favorite thing in this class, uh, overcome trade barriers, uh, pool resources for very large capital products, um, or just learn uh, from your competitor, be it uh, technologically or uh, some business efficiency uh, or process that you want to learn from them. Uh, vertical and horizontal, you can have competition responding strategies or uh, competition reducing strategies and uh, uncertainty reducing strategies. So an example of uh, vertical and horizontal is fairly uh, straightforward. It just sort of similar idea to integration, but instead of actually buying those companies, you just become strategic partners with them. Uh, competition responding strategy. So this would be when like the airlines uh, work together uh, and uh, have sort of their network of airlines that they work with around the world. Um, so one of those was created, then other airlines had to join uh, that one or create their own so that they would not be at a disadvantage uh, in that they weren't able to, as a single airline, service the entire globe. Um, and so you have that sort of competition uh, responding strategy. Um, now, competition reducing strategy would be sort of something that would uh, lean more towards a, a tacit collusion kind of thing where uh, we all sort of are creating these alliances uh, to uh, protect ourselves uh, as the incumbents from uh, outside people coming in because we're working together and new entrants would not have the advantage of working together like we are. And then uncertainty, uh, just a lot of times uh, spreading out the risk uh, can help uh, reduce those type of things. Competition responding strategy. Uh, another example is Amazon's Kindle was taking over the world, um, selling an ebook reader below cost, um, but the content providers were not happy with the sort of fixed price of $9.99 for all books. Um, and they were afraid that Amazon was going to basically uh, kill all of their profits. So uh, they allied with Apple's iPad um, and set out to uh, 
set prices higher. Um, unfortunately, they were not as good at the tacit part of that collusion um, and were eventually uh, got in trouble uh, for colluding to uh, raise prices. Another uh, diversifying alliance, uh, Marriott and Nickelodeon, uh, came together to make Nickelodeon Resorts Marriott. Uh, so sort of leveraging the characters from the Nickelodeon shows to be more of a uh, fun resort at uh, Marriott, sort of similar to uh, what Disney resorts do. Uh, so this allowed Marriott to better compete with those uh, Disney-themed resorts um, and also allowed Nickelodeon to uh, get some cross-branding abilities and make some revenue in a different stream. Another synergistic alliance, we have Cargill, uh, who makes uh, Stevia coming together uh, with Coca-Cola uh, to create Truvia. So uh, Cargill had uh, Stevia, but figuring out how to best uh, make its sweetness come out and then uh, having the massive distribution of Coca-Cola. So they uh, created this alliance to uh, improve the product and then distribute it, and obviously that's done very well. International corporate strategy. So a cross-border alliance uh, can be used uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, a lot of times it's because uh, the firms in the outside market either uh, don't have good knowledge of the customers or regulations, uh, just all of the various things of doing business in that country, um, or there is some specific government restriction that makes it uh, difficult for them to enter uh, Greenfield. Uh, so a cross-border alliance can make a lot of sense. Um, these can be riskier than domestic counterparts, um, partially because uh, the firm outside of the country that's trying to get in uh, is really just trying potentially uh, just trying to get a foothold that will then, you know, get rid of the domestic uh, partner as soon as they can. Uh, on the flip side, the domestic partner uh, could uh, gain access to uh, learning and resources from uh, the foreign partner who's coming in, uh, learn what they need to do, uh, gain scale and exposure in their country, and then, you know, sort of leave the foreign firm in the dust once they've, you know, grown sufficiently. An example of this uh, would be Walmart uh, and their uh, obviously famous business model, uh, working with uh, Cifra Grupo, uh, who had good knowledge of the market in Mexico. And uh, so they sort of set up these firms that were, you know, sort of co-branded um, to have the benefits of both. Um, but now, several years later, uh, they're, they're just Walmarts in Mexico. So Walmart sort of moved beyond the alliance. Another shift in alliances is that they're now becoming more like uh, networks. Uh, back in the day, when there were only a few alliances going on, uh, you had a firm, connected to some other firms. Uh, it was pretty separate. But now uh, you have these networks of firms and firms uh, connected uh, to uh, further off firms through sort of multiple contractual arrangements. Um, and so uh, the importance of where firms are in that network can make a big difference. <clears throat> Here is a hypothetical example of some various firms. You have, you know, these set of firms over here where firm A is connected uh, with most of all the firms are very interconnected over here. So pretty much everyone is connected to everyone. You know, there are pros and cons to that setup, but it's unlikely that, uh, any one of these firms has a real advantage over the other firms from an information standpoint. It's possible that if one of these firms is huge, they can kind of you know, bully the other firms, but at least from an informational standpoint, uh, they're pretty similar. Uh, meanwhile, firm B, who is you know, over here in this sort of other network, uh, is a sort of bridge between these networks. And so they have an informational advantage uh, that allows them to sort of know what's going on with these firms and know what's going on with those firms. And they can either take advantage of that themselves or sort of, you know, sell that information uh, to somebody who 
can take advantage of it. So either way, they sort of have an advantage. Um, and you can kind of see that there are you know, gaps in the network. And then you know, meanwhile, you have this little firm all by itself. Uh, so it does not have any advantage from the network. <coughs> uh, I guess I don't want to broker. All right, so here's an example of just how interconnected uh, some of our larger technology firms are. Uh, this is a little bit of an older uh, picture. You can tell it says American Online down here. Um, but it shows just sort of how much uh, these firms are connected, um, whether they are strategic partnerships uh, or actual investments or the red lines, uh, so an equity partnership. Smaller companies that are sort of attached aren't shown, but you can sort of see how uh, especially if you're certain firms, you're sort of a hub of all of these other different uh, firms, and that puts you in a good uh, bargaining position. Uh, competitive risks in cooperative strategy. So uh, if you have inadequate contracts, uh, misrepresentation of your competencies, uh, so you know, uh, much like the due diligence of an acquisition, uh, you can have the same thing happen in a strategic alliance where firms sort of talk a great game but actually aren't that good. You can have instances where firms just for politics or culture or other reasons just don't do a good job of actually using their complementary resources um, or trying to hold each other uh, hostage in some way. The ways to sort of mitigate this are detailed contracts and monitoring uh, and developing trusting relationships. So contracts are great, um, but obviously it is difficult to foresee all eventualities. So contracts are always a solution. Um, also, there is a cost to sort of monitoring your employees and those contracts. And um, so as you try to monitor more and more, you start increasing the costs of this joint venture. Um, and then that, you know, sort of defeats the purpose of a lot of your value that you're gaining could be lost in just trying to make sure that the other guy doesn't screw you. Uh, trusting relationships, obviously, much like human relationships, take time to uh, develop, um, but have a lot of benefits. Um, but of course, the desired uh, outcome is to create value, additional value through this uh, partnership. You think about the learning and losing race. Firms can sort of engage in trying to learn more from the other firm than they're sort of letting the other firm learn from them. So it's going to be a sort of learning race to uh, see who learns the most uh, during the partnership so that once you're no longer partners, uh, you have gained an advantage from that. Okay, managing the risk. So uh, again, this is, you know, sort of different ways you can try to mitigate the risk of this partnership. Uh, some is through, you know, how you set up knowledge sharing routines to try to keep things compartmentalized firm specific investments that are sort of we will you know give you access to x but not y just sort of the level of trust that they have here and then overall that is you know are you having good uh, alliance governance of that sort of monitoring and making sure uh, that you're keeping the honest people honest so trust the things that can happen with trust uh, you have the initial conditions of sort of is there some reason that you shouldn't trust these people? Are they, you know, coming in very heavy handedly uh, in the negotiation process? Some other reason. Uh, during the negotiation, are they being cutthroat? Are they being open? Um, reciprocal experiences. Have you worked with this firm in the past? Did they screw you then? Did it work out well then? And then sort of outside behavior, you know, sort of the reputation of this firm. Is this a firm that is known for, you know, keeping its word or you know, trying to be very aggressive and uh, take advantage of its partners to get ahead. All right, so trust and partnerships. So trust is increasingly becoming an important aspect of these strategies. Firms are now recognizing what, you know, people have realized for a long time that working with people who are trustworthy is worth it. Uh, when trust exists, uh, it is much easier to sort of manage to maximizing the pursuit of opportunities that work best for both partners and uh, create the best added value and profit and other things for both partners. Uh, without trust, you have formal contracts, extensive monitoring. This can get very expensive. 
And in this case, the interest is sort of to minimize the cost and maximize the opportunities. You're sort of very defensive. You're trying to sort of keep yourself from you know, losing too much, letting too much go, um, and therefore often miss the chance to maximize your opportunity. All right, finally, the value net uh, can help you identify opportunities for cooperation. Um, this is just a way to you know, look around. Are, there, are your customers, if they're not end customers, someone that you could uh, integrate with in some type of alliance? Same with suppliers, do some type of vertical alliance. Uh, is there some way that you and your competitors could ally together against sort of you know, your common foes of other competitors? Or perhaps you know some government regulation that's coming out, and you're going to stand together and try to convince uh, the government officials that they don't want to pass that regulation. Would be another type of alliance you might uh, be in. And then uh, just complementers. I mean, a lot of times there are firms that are selling some complementary product that, uh, if you all work together, can you know increase uh, the complementariness, uh, integrate better, and make both sides work better.